Hello, Facebook. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Larry's Library. Hopefully you will be able to find this. I apologize for the I apologize for the technical difficulties. This is <clears throat> we're going to be reading chapters 11 and 12 of <clears throat> Treasure Island. And I may wait until some people sign in and are watching. Now, we'll get started, and I'll read this, and then we'll, we'll share it and let everybody see it who wants to. Chapter 11, What I Heard in the Apple Barrel. No, not I, said Silver. Flint was captain. I was quartermaster, along of my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg. Old Pew lost his deadlights. It was a master surgeon, him that amputated me, out of college and all, Latin by the bucket. And what Latin by the bucket and whatnot, but he was hanged like a dog and sun dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Roberts's men that was, and come to changing names of their ships, Royal Fortune and so on. Now, what a ship was christened, so let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra that's brought us all safe home from Malabar after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old walrus. Flint's old ship, as I've seen a muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah, cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. And Davis was a man, too, by all accounts, said Silver. I never sailed along of him, first with England, now with Flint. That's my story. And now here on my own account, in a matter of speaking, I laid by 900 safe from England and 2,000 after Flint. That ain't bad for a man before the mast, all safe in the bank. Tain't earning now, it's saving, does it? You may lay to that. Where's all England's mid now? I don't know. Where's Flint's? Why, most on them board here and glad to get the duff. Been begging before that, some on them. Old Pew has had lost his sight and might have thought shame. Spends 1,200 pounds in a year, like a lord in parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches. But for two years before that, shiver my timbers, the man was starving. He begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that by the powers. Well, it ain't much use after, <clears throat> well, it ain't much use after all, said the young seaman. It ain't much use for fools, you may lay to it, that nor nothing, cried Silver, but now you look here. You're young, you are. But now you, <clears throat> but you're as smart as paint. I, I see that when I set my eyes on my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he had used to myself. I think if I had been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime, he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks. And when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now the most goes for rum and a good fling and to sea again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywhere, by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark you. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough, too, says you. Ah, but I've lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself of nothing heart desires, and slept soft and ate dainty all my days. But when at sea, and how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well, said another, but all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You daren't show face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was? asked Silver derisively. At Bristol, in banks and places, answered his companion. It were, said the cook, it were when we weighed anchor. But my old missus has it all by now. And the spyglass is sold, lease and goodwill and rigging, and the girl's off to meet me. I would tell you where, for I trust you, but it'd make jealousy among the mates. And you, and can you trust your missus? asked the other. Gentlemen of fortune, returned the cook. 
usually trust little among themselves, and right they are. You may lay to it, but I have a way with me I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean, it won't be in the same world with old John. There was some that was feared of Pew, and some that was feared of Flint. But Flint his own self was feared of me. Feared he was, and proud. They was the roughest crew afloat, was Flint's. The devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with them. Well, now I tell you, I'm not a boasting man, and you see in yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. Ah, you may be sure of yourself an old John's ship. Well, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't half a quarter like the job till I had this talk with you, John, but there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart too, answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrels shook. And a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clapped my eyes on. By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune, they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate. And the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point I was soon to be relieved, for Silver giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. Dick Square, said Silver. Oh, I know Dick was square, returned the voice of Coxswain Israel Hands. He's no fool, is Dick? And he turned his quid and spat. But look here, he went on, here's what I want to know, Barbecue. How long are we a going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? I've had a most enough of Captain Smollett. He's hazed me long enough, by thunder. I want to go into that cabin, I do. I want their pickles and wines and that. Israel, said Silver, your head ain't much account, nor ever was, but you're able to hear, I reckon, leastways. Your ears is big enough. Now here's what I say. You'll berth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word, and you may lay to that, old son. Well, I, I don't say no, do I? growled the coxswain. What I say is when. That, that's what I say. When? By the powers, cried Silver. Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. Here's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship for us. Here's this squire and doctor with a map and such. I, I don't know where it is, do I? No more to you, says you. Well, then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff and help us to get it aboard by the powers. Then we'll see. If I was sure of all you sons of double Dutchmen, I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us halfway back again before I struck. Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think, said the lad Dick. <clears throat> we're all foxly hands, you mean, snapped Silver. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen split on, first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with him at the island as soon as the blunt's on board, and a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides. I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. Easy all, Long John, cried Israel. Who's across of you? Why, how many tall ships think you now have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads drying in the sun at execution dock, cried Silver. And all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry, you hear me? I seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you'd only lay your course and a pint to windward, you would ride in carriages, you would. But not you, I know you. You'll have your mouth full of rum tomorrow and go hang. Everybody would know you was kind of a chaplain, John, but there's others as could hand and steer as well as you, said Israel. They liked the bit of fun they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling like jolly companions, every one. So, says Silver, where and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Ah, they was a sweet crew, they was. Only, where are they? But, asked Dick, when do we lay them athwart? What are we to do with them anyhow? There's the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. 
Well, what would you think? Put them ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut them down like that much pork? That would have been Flint's or Billy Bones's. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now himself. He knows the long and short of it now. And if ever a rough hand came to port, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver, rough and ready. But mark you here. I'm an easy man. I'm quite the gentleman, says you. But this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin of coming home unlooked for like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, but when the time comes, why, let her rip. John, cries the coxswain, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see, said Silver. Only one thing I claim. I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands. Dick? He added, breaking off. You just jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leaped out and run for it if I had found the strength, but my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then someone seemingly stopped him, and the voice of Hans exclaimed, Oh, stow that! Don't you get sucking of that bilge, John! Let's have a go of the rum! Dick, said Silver, I trust you. I've, I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a panicking up and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little, Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence, Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news. For besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them will jine. Hence, they were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one after another of the trio took the pannikin and drank, one to luck, another with a, here's to old Flint, and Silver himself saying in a kind of song, here's to ourselves and hold your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of snuff. Just then, a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up, I found the moon had risen and was silvering the mizzen top and shining wide on the luff of the foresail, and almost at the same time, the voice of the lookout shouted, Land Ho! Chapter 12 Council of War There was a great rush of feet across the deck. I could hear people tumbling up from the cabin and the foxley. And slipping in an inst slipping in an instant outside my barrel, I dived behind the foresail, made a double towards the stern, and came out upon the open deck in time to join Hunter and Dr. Livesey in the rush for the weather bow. There, all hands were already congregated. A belt of fog had lifted almost simultaneously with the appearance of the moon. Away to the southwest of us, we saw two low hills about a couple of miles apart. And rising behind one of them, a third and higher hill, whose peak was still buried in the fog, all three seemed sharp and conical in figure. So much I saw, almost in a dream, for I had not yet recovered from my horrid fear of a minute or two before. And then I heard the voice of Captain Smollett issuing orders. The Hispaniola was laid a couple of points nearer the wind, and now sailed a course that would just clear the island on the east. And now, men! said the captain when all was sheeted home. Has any one of you ever seen that land ahead? I have, sir, said Silver. I've watered there with a trader I was cook in. The anchorage is on the south behind an island, I fancy, asked the captain. Yes, sir. Skeleton Island, they calls it. They were a main place for pirates once, and a hand we had on board knowed all their names for it. That hill to the north they calls the Foremast Hill. There are three hills in a row running southward, four main and mizzen, sir. But the main, that's a big one with a cloud on it. They usually calls the spyglass by reason of a lookout they kept when they was in the anchorage cleaning. For it's there they clean their ships, sir, asking for pardon. I have a chart here, says Captain Smollett. See if that's the place. Long John's eyes burned in his head as he took the chart. But by the fresh look of the paper, I knew he was doomed to disappointment. This was not the map we found in Billy Bones's chest, but an accurate copy, complete in all things, names and heights and soundings, 
with the single exception of the red crosses and the written notes. Sharp as must have been his annoyance, Silver had the strength of mind to hide it. Yes, sir, said he. This is the spot to be sure and very prettily draw it out. Who might have done that, I wonder? The pirates were too ignorant, I reckon. Ah, here it is. Captain Kidd's Anchorage. Just the name my shipmate called it. There's a strong current runs along the south, and then away norward up the west coast. Right you was, sir, says he, to haul your wind and keep the weather of the island. Leastways, if such was your intention, as to enter and careen. And there ain't no better place for that in these waters. Thank you, my man, says Captain Swallow. I'll ask you later on to give us a help. You may go. I was surprised at the coolness with which John avowed his knowledge of the island, and I own I was half frightened when I saw him drawing nearer to myself. He did not know, to be sure, that I had overheard his counsel from the apple barrel, and yet I had, by this time, taken such a horror of his cruelty, duplicity, and power that I could scarce conceal a shudder when he laid his hand upon my arm. Ah, says he, this here is a sweet spot, this island, a sweet spot for a lad to get ashore on. You'll bathe, and you'll climb trees, and you'll hunt goats, you will. And you'll get aloft on them hills like a goat yourself. Why, it makes me young again. I was going to forget my timber leg, I was. It's a pleasant thing to be young and have ten toes, and you may lay to that. When you want to go a bit of exploring, you just ask old John, and he'll put up a snack for you to take along. And clapping me in the friendliest way upon the shoulder, he hobbled off forward and went below. Captain Smollett, the squire, and Dr. Livesey were talking together on the quarterdeck, and anxious as I was to tell them my story, I durst not interrupt them openly. While I was still casting about in my thoughts to find some probable excuse, Dr. Livesey called me to his side. He had left his pipe below, and being a slave to tobacco, had meant that I should fetch it. But as soon as I was near enough to speak and not be overheard, I broke out immediately. Doctor, let me speak. Get the captain and squire down to the cabin and then make some pretense to send for me. I have terrible news. The doctor changed countenance a little, but next moment he was master of himself. Thank you, Jim, said he quite loudly. That was all I wanted to know, as if he had asked me a question. And with that, he turned on his heel and rejoined the other two. They spoke together for a little, and though none of them started or raised his voice or so much as whistled, it was plain enough that Dr. Livesey had communicated my request. For the next thing that I heard was the captain giving an order to Job Anderson, and all hands were piped on deck. My lads, said Captain Smollett, I have a word to say to you. This land that we have sighted is a place we've been sailing to. Mr. Trelawney, being a very open-handed gentleman, as we all know, has just asked me a word or two, and as I was able to tell him that every man on board had done his duty a low and aloft, I was, as I had never asked to see it done better, why... He and I and the doctor are going below to the cabin to drink to your health and luck. And you'll have grog served out for you to drink to our health and luck. I'll tell you what I think of this. I think it handsome. And if you think as I do, you'll give a good sea cheer for the gentleman that does it. The cheer followed. That was a matter of course. But it rang out so full and hearty that I confess I could hardly believe these same men were plotting for our blood. One more cheer for Captain Smollett cried Long John when the first had subsided, and this also was given with a will. On the top of that, the three gentlemen went below, and not long after, word was sent forward that Jim Hawkins was wanted in the cabin. I found them all three seated round the table, a bottle of Spanish wine and some raisins before them, and the doctor smoking away with his wig on his lap, and that, I knew, was a sign he was agitated. The stern window was open, for it was a warm night, and you could see the moon shining behind on the ship's wake. Now, Hawkins. Now, Hawkins, said the squire, you have something to say? Speak up. I did as I was bid, and as short as I could make it, told the whole details of Silver's conversation. Nobody interrupted me till I was done, nor did any one of the three of them make so much as a movement, but they kept their eyes upon my face from first to last. Jim? said Dr. Livesey. Take a seat. And they made me sit down at table beside them, poured me out a glass of wine, filled my hands with raisins, and all three, one after the other, and each with a bow, drank my good health and their service to me for my luck and courage. Now, Captain, said the squire, you were right and I was wrong. I owe myself an ass and I await your orders. No more an ass than I, sir, returned the captain. 
I never heard of a crew that meant to mutiny, but what showed signs before, for any man that had an eye in his head to see the mischief and take steps according. But this crew, he added, beats me. Captain, said the doctor, with your permission, that's Silver, a very remarkable man. He'd look remarkably well from a yard arm, sir, returned the captain. But this is talk, this don't lead to anything. I see three or four points, and with Mr. Trelawney's permission, I'll name them. You, sir, are the captain. It is for you to speak, says Mr. Trelawney grandly. First, first point, began Mr. Smollett. We must go on, because we can't turn back. If I gave the word to go about, they would rise at once. Second point, we have time before us, at least until this treasure is found. Third point, there are faithful hands. Now, sir, it's got to come to blows sooner or later, and what I propose is to take time by the forelock, as the saying is, and come to blows some fine day when they least expect it. We can count, I take it, on your own home servants, Mr. Trelawney. <clears throat> as upon myself, declared the squire. Three, reckoned the captain, ourselves make seven. Counting Hawkins here, now about the honest hands. Most likely Trelawney's own men, said the doctor, those he had picked up for himself before he lit on silver. Nay, replied the squire, hands was one of mine. I did think I could have trusted hands, said the captain. <clears throat> and to think that they're all Englishmen, broke out the squire. Sir, I can find it in my heart to blow the ship up. Well, gentlemen, said the captain, the best that I can say is not much. We must lay to, if you please, and keep a bright lookout. It's trying on a man, I know. It would be pleasanter to come to blows, but there's no help for it till we know our men. Lay to and whistle for a wind, that's my view. Jim here, said the doctor, can help us more than anyone. The men are not shy with him, and Jim is a noticing lad. Hawkins, I put prodigious faith in you, added the squire. I began to feel pretty desperate at this, for I felt altogether helpless, and yet, by an odd train of circumstances, it was indeed through me that safety came. In the meantime, talk as we pleased, there were only seven out of the twenty-six on whom we could rely, and out of these seven, one was a boy, so that the grown men on our side were six to their nineteen. It's the end of... End of section two, section three, my shore adventure will start tomorrow at about 7.30, chapter 13, how I began my shore adventure. I will not post a, uh, a preview of it like I tried today because I couldn't figure out how to get that to work. Thank you, everyone. Please share this around and put any comments so that I know that somebody's watching this. Uh, keep your hands clean. Keep socially distanced. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. And everybody stay safe. Goodbye. And this has been Larry's Library. Hi, Uncle Kevin. Hi, Uncle Kevin. Hi, Uncle Kevin. Hi, Kevin.